that we make to the receiver the radio listener we appeal to the person who creates the piece the artist's subjectivity it has to be harmonic los ingredientes con los que vamos a trabajar son los elementos del lenguaje it has to sound good. It is a completely free genre when it comes to framework. There is no rigid diagram or structure that allow us to design the radio art. You're listening to the noise of the vessel. Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. Sure. Well, I am Marina Rosenfeld, and I'm on the line with you right now from Brooklyn, New York. I'm pretty much a lifelong New Yorker with a stint in Los Angeles in the 1990s. So I'm based in New York, and I am an artist and a composer, and sometimes a performer. Okay, sometimes performer. <laughs> Well, less frequently than I used to, so. But mostly I'm creating works involving sound and human beings, bodies, and sometimes objects, sculpture and drawing. And I'm probably a little bit unusual in that my practice since a long time actually has kind of had an equal foot in the uh, well, now you can hear I'm in New York. Can you hear that? <laughs> New York. <laughs> you got coming. an immediate, immediate uh, vibe of New York. Uh, what I think what I was just saying was been true for me for a long time that I kind of have one foot in the world of, or the format of, and thus the world of exhibition, and the other in the world of live performance and concert. So.
So for about, since around 2016, 2017, the palette of sounds that I'm using is fairly small. It's kind of like one way I could describe the whole, I mean, at this point, it's like almost 30 years of practice. And one way I could describe that is trying not to expand the vocabulary in a way at the level of sound that my the pressure that I put on what I think you just called like a search for sounds it's more kind of trying to contain and stay with a certain body of sounds or it's kind of a finite set of sounds so for a long time those were the sounds I put on dub plates that I could manipulate as a turntablist um, and in more recent years I've moved a bit further afield from that but sort of like vocal sounds at the level really of the utterance something kind of quite close to the bone basic essential maybe just kind of what is the sound of my voice in a space in a room in a corridor indoors outdoors but so mostly indoors i will say but sort of how does the voice allow me to sort of determine how a space resonates and then alongside that kind of fragments traces so less i'm less interested in a kind of a direct event than the trace of the event so noise white noise colored noise and then synthetic sounds so a kind of right now i'm i've in the last few years working quite a bit with some about a group of sounds that come from an early synthesizer of a historical instrument called the voter and then, of course, instruments, because if you play with people, maybe you have a pianist or maybe you have a cellist or maybe you have a bass player. So, But it emanates from this sort of smaller set, which is like the sound of my voice, the traces I left on the dub plates, the traces of the traces, and the traces of those traces. It's this kind of like infinitely reprocessed, finite set somehow.
es el mensaje. It's very, very interesting what you're saying, and I was very interested about your relationship with turntables, because it, it seems like one of the constants of your work, even if you're using other media and, and other mixtures of media. Is it something, or is there something that attaches you towards this player instead of, for example, cassette tapes or real-to-real -real tapes? Also very present in sound art and, and sound installation. I think there definitely is. I've recently done a new piece, actually just less than a week ago, um, here in New York. A new piece that doesn't even have a title yet, but that was about that was part of a, a kind of a lecture performance that I gave at the Dia Foundation last week on the artist Marianne Cecila. But I went back to the turntable for this piece because there, it's just such a. You know, it's not really the turntable, the machine that interests me. It's the quality of sounds on dub plates. I'm not even that interested in vinyl records. I mean, I like them, but I, I'm not like obsessed with vinyl. You know, some people in, in my area might be like co record collectors and constantly going to record fairs and assembling rare cuts. And I don't do any of that. What I'm interested in is this very tactile, rich, specific, kind of unusual quality that the sounds I've been making for all these years have. It's kind of almost like an alchemy. Those sounds inscribed in the medium of acetate and then transmitted through the cartridge. There's just something there that to me is more the morphology of the sounds is clearer. There's a kind of shape and obvious kind of transformation about it. I feel like the things that I'm interested in become audible in that medium, whereas if they're like a digital file living on the internet, I'm quite a bit less interested. You know, there's something there that happens and that you can touch it. You have the sense with your hand or that which the ear then understands that you're touching the sound. You place the needle into this prepared groove and something very immediate and kind of endlessly scintillating is happening there at the level of the sound.
importance of the voice in your work? You know, the voice is also kind of a constant. There was a period of time where I was writing um, large vocal compositions, like choir works. In fact, the piece, uh, probably the more well, the most well-known of those, a work called Teenage Lantano, which was premiered in New York in 2008. I'm actually mounting next month in Ghent in Belgium in a new production so that's both at the choral level and then in the term the sense of just the individual voice that there's sort of two parallel threads there but I think in a more in a broader sense I'm interested in sort of recuperating the specificity of my own experience as an artist I think in my education and training the pressure was to in a way not be yourself to uh, anyone who's had a classical music training would know about this probably the, the pressure is to both is to sort of efface the self and to especially face those qualities that make you outside of the the you know distinguish you from the kind of ideal which comes from Western European male-dominated hegemonic culture. So the sense in which you may have interests or affiliations or kind of tendencies or predilections that mark you as female, let's say, are generally like those should be removed. <laughs> so in early, early in my career, I developed a kind of a very oppositional attitude about this particular dynamic. But obviously, this applies across a broader, you know, that's my particular angle. But obviously, across ethnicity and geography and race and other of these kind of um, categorical distinctions that we draw this would also be true, right? So I think the voice just became a marker for me, a way of kind of like marking femaleness in a space. Just let the voice come out, put a kind of definitive detourment of some kind on the possibility that this, whatever's going to be happening here in this piece of music or in this work is going to toe the line. It's, it's Maybe it's just a way of saying like, no, it's not. I think that's really where it comes from. That's, of course, my view retrospectively. That wasn't necessarily my view over the, over the many years of practice that I'm kind of generalizing about. But I see it a bit like that from today's vantage point. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, really interesting that you say. And I got this. The voice is a mark and can identify us. And it's a, like the digital mark. And for example, when you feed the, the artificial intelligence with the voice, can identify different tones, height, um, volume, even sensation. So this is the thing that will come, is the next. But now artificial intelligence is a fashion, all the people talk, talk, talk. But the voice is still there, it's a mark, it's a trace. You can follow the sound of the voice. And as another artist told me, the voice is an instrument too. And when you listen your some albums from you, I found the voice use it as an instrument, but use it as a mark. I think that the voice is like a mark. It's like a um, a sort of signifier also of, for me, the one of the things that in the early period of my life I struggled with and then I became kind of in love with, which is that I feel that listening itself, hearing the way we hear the world is very unstable. The same thing on two different days is two different things. You know, I have like, an, I'm always fascinated by the contingencies of, of a situation and how our, we're, we're kind of like, you know, this is very different between us and AI, right? Like we don't have an algorithm that reduces all of our perceptual inputs down to a formula. <laughs> so that's like, you know, there's no formula. I think one has to actually, in a way, fall in love with the difficulty of reproducing sensation, reproducing impression, the flux that we experience. So I think the voice is like a very easy way to maybe access that difficulty and especially because it's very hard to hear your own voice you have a fantasy of your voice that is what you hear in your head but obviously <laughs> as anyone who's ever heard their voice in a recording knows um that's not correct or that's not the only voice that you have grateful for that because you're mentioning something that sometimes it's it, we kind of lose sight of that in terms of for example the fact that although we don't recognize our own voice as ours everyone around does so and they say yeah it's your voice 
it sounds correctly, it sounds it has to sound. And you assist and you say, no, it's not. So in those terms, is it listening an activity that seems to be understood as something homogeneous? Because if I think of what we were talking, uh, it's true that it's not. And if it does, even then we, we don't agree about the same thing. It's like when people go to a concert, people attend a concert and depending on the place you're located is how you listen to and how you receive sound. And I ask, I ask this because you, have, you work with the environment a lot and you work with the environments a lot, and which makes me think about this John Cage's assumptions of, of the traffic and what happens with traffic. And about the time that his work was going, his, his very work was going to disappear into traffic, which is the time that, that he halted and he started filling up the catalog instead of his work dissolving into the traffic. Yeah. I think any theory that purports to be, that homogenizes like the nature of listening to sounds is probably starting from the wrong place. So I really do believe that. And I think that as we become kind of ever more, at least in the present moment, identitarian and kind of sectarian in our emphasis globally and locally, at least uh, also on difference, there's sort of like difference and then there are differences. I've always been, I've always thought about the possibilities that are that sort of like music composition as a, a practice that is very amenable to the kind of promise uh, or problem of contingency that music composition is a space where one can begin from a more contingent and not universal or kind of homogenized approach to organizing behavior or kind of like creating a situation. There's so many layers to that, you thinking through sounds, you're thinking through a structure, there's the format of performance, there's the possibility of the intervention of other people, interpreters, there's like all of that kind of agonistic, potentially abrasive difficulty around mounting a work with other people. You know, it's not exactly, if you're a composer and you're working with performers, it's not exactly uh, collaboration isn't exactly the right word, although collaboration is part of it. But there's also something about providing or offering or suggesting a form and then having that form be like separately enacted from you. That's why I said sometimes I'm a performer, but lately, frequently, I'm not the performer. And so I'm passing on possibilities for building new structures to other people who also have agency and ideas and psychology as the composer does. And so I think like that's that's the really interesting thing about like conceiving of what one does actually as composition, not because you're necessarily interested in the conservative um, historical 19th century idea of the composer, but because composition can be kind of reconstructed from the ground up as kind of self-conscious set of like nested contingencies or kind of ecologies around objects, bodies, practices, vocabularies. Yeah, in, in the sense of providing room for openness and providing room for flux, which is something that it's curious not to be seen in, in such a light when we talk about the score, for example, as a visual artifact or paintings or pictures. Everything seems so fixed that the only way to manipulate them was through collages and, and afterwards through software. So, oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it's very refreshing that, that approach of yours of, of, of providing room for that. And providing, I mean, you perform on your works, you as a performer. Is it because you, you don't want to pass the task to someone else, or is it uh, <laughs> because it, it just so happens? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, because I do think like one of the things that one deals with are, I won't be the first person to say this, and you know, this is also like a really important idea inside improvised music and inside jazz and other improvised music histories, that improvisation is this kind of like negotiation with your own agency and that of others. 
And so it's, if you do a solo performance, obviously you're just dealing with yourself, but sometimes dealing with yourself is actually the hardest, the hardest thing to do. So there's no like get out of school free approach, I guess I would say to this problem. But I do think that sometimes one chooses to perform because you have something to do. You have a new piece or an opportunity and like that is the easiest way to get that that thing out there in the world is to do it yourself. But in general, I'm very privileged to work with some pretty extraordinary interpreters and performers and kind of really trained, incredible musicians who also have improvisation threads through their practice. So like certain, the musicians that I go back again and again to are all these kind of like very special people who inevitably bring, they bring something to what you give them that go that goes beyond it. So you yourself would definitely not be able to bring what they bring.
What is the importance of noise and silence in your work? Open question. Very good question. I'm going to just, I'll answer part of it this way. And it's interesting because I just spent a few months really working on the music and legacy of Marianne Zazila and, you know, by extension, Lamont Young and early minimalism, thinking about and listening to uh, some of their what one can listen to. It's just kind of hard to listen to that theater of eternal music, as you know. Actually, what I would say is almost a kind of aversion that I have to drone music. I don't really... I find continuous sounds with no silences between them not the thing that I enjoy. So it was nice to kind of dig into that and dig into it critically and and actually critically relative to myself too, to like my taste and where does my taste come from? What am I, you know, but what I would say about my own music is that silence is extremely important, not because I want to make the listener sit there in silence, but something that we could by kind of, by shorthand call silence is actually the space where I think one encounters the decay and ending of sounds. And I'm really interested in those. I'm like way more interested in how a sound decays or with the shape of its ending and what it comes right after, what some people will call the after sound, the sort of psychic, sonic, mental, acoustic impression that it leaves and the morphology of that than I am in the attack. Because like all attacks are more or less the same thing. It's just like something starts. But how sounds end is like way more interesting to me. So I can't do that if everything is continuous. And especially because my music has been involved in spatialization spaces, like three dimensions, as opposed to like front, frontal concert scenarios. The majority of my work over 30 years is spatial in some way. It's not a kind of like frontal or headphones experience. So if you don't allow sounds to decay, you are missing like 99% of what's interesting about spatializing sound. So that's my position about that. So noise, I don't think about noise per se, but I think about, I would substitute in the word signal that sounds can also be just kind of like probes or signals or kind of, I think I would rather maybe use the word event like a sound event, it's a thing that happens, it's an emanation, it's directional, it's a transaction, some 
kind of technical processes have been carried out for that thing to happen. It's got an event like quality. And then it, when it enters a space and briefly blooms or percolates in the space or disperses, that's when you're actually encountering the end of the, that thing is when you're really encountering the space too. So for whatever reason of taste or characterological reason or affiliation, that like that's mainly what I'm in. I'm really interested in that.
I have one question, but I'm not sure if we have time for it. <laughs> okay. Do we have? <laughs> I was wondering about when you talk about your taste and your taste conflicts, if, if that has, has happened throughout the making of your, any of your works. You're sometimes coming across something you, you don't like as a listener, or you say, I don't like this, but I don't know how it sort of came out. Has it happened to you? Oh, totally. I'm like, a, I mean, the closer the zone is to one's own work, the more hypercritical you are, I think. That's pretty normal. So, like, I can be like, dislike things very easily. And then if it's kind of coming across, you know, from another domain, I can easily fall in love. I fall in love with like voices. There's like different artists who have just an extraordinary voice. And then I'll spend time with that voice, you know, or the sound of certain people. Like I'm very tuned into timbre. So for instance, like for me, a voice could be Don Cherry's trumpet, you know, that's so specific and it has such a, almost a texture that you could touch. So for me, that's that's close to a, like a voice I could fall, fall in love with and have to listen to. <laughs> yeah, so like, where does taste come from? I think it's probably, you know, your taste in music or your taste in art or your taste in food, your taste in people times of day. I mean, where does it come from? It, it's, you know, if you're a parent that every child comes completely already preloaded <laughs> with taste. Where does it come from? I don't know. Of course, it's shaped by your cultural experiences and your personal history, but those things are, who knows? I don't know where it comes from. And as an artist, I think one of the kind of um, prerogatives we have is to actually like go further you know you take what you have and tighten it up twist it up like just to you know get really you can there's something to like endlessly probably challenge but also just kind of like be in the strangeness of the fact that like one color doesn't feel the same to you as another why i don't know this has been absolutely fantastic thank you so much thank you for uh tracking me down up here okay no thank you thank you thank, thank you. you it's our pleasure yes. yeah it's our pleasure totally mine as well thank you why no estoy en la nube I'm in cloud nine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me also <laughs> Es el mensaje. Vamos por más, dice la rana, escúchame, ¿eh? Esto recién empieza. Se <risa> puede esperar, Tamita. Bueno, 